share my screen. Microsoft PowerPoint. Here we go. Oh, sorry, I've got to enable some sort of privacy thing here. Using Zoom money, new computer for the first time this semester. Okay, can you all see that screen? Can somebody unmute and confirm? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, last time we talked on our special topic on performance and specifically about vertical jumping. Um, if your goal is maximize uh, jump height, then a counter movement jump is the best thing to do and arm swing should be included in that jump. Um, those aren't terribly interesting. Those are just kind of factoids. What's more interesting biomechanically is why the counter movement helps and why arm swing helps. Um, best explanation, I think, for counter movement is that it's simply a longer motion. Um, you spend more time with your feet on the ground, more time to develop a big vertical impulse, uh, more time for cross bridge cycling and to allow muscles to de develop large forces. And I think that's probably uh, why the counter movement jump is uh, the higher jump than the squat jump. It just takes a longer amount of time with your feet on the ground. Uh, to do it. Um, arm swing, why does that help? A little bit murkier. Um, I think it has to do with allowing you to uh, get your trunk oriented upright in a timely fashion and direct your force vertically uh, through the trunk and through uh, the center of mass. Um, if you want to train for jump height, um, lower leg uh, strength and power is, of course, important, particularly quadriceps uh, strength. Um, but increasing strength is not enough. You also have to practice to uh, retrain your body how to take advantage of that new strength and coordinate the new strength uh, with your muscles and with the other uh, muscles in the body to, to, to learn how to use that new strength uh, to jump higher. So not, not, just, not enough just to get strong. You also have to uh, learn how to coordinate the motion and take advantage of that strength. Um, that's for jumping. I would argue that probably extends to uh, basically all sports motions, at least like powerful athletic type sport motions. It's not going to be enough just to get stronger. You got to learn how to use that strength and power too. Okay, this is a new lecture. I haven't given this one before, so we're exploring uh, unexplored territory here. This is a new one that I added uh, just this semester. Um, it's so new that the first time I uploaded it, I forgot to add any focus questions. And so if you've been downloading these slides and your copy doesn't have any focus questions, please go on the website and download them again. I re-uploaded a new version that uh, that had some focus questions uh, for today. So please download that if you if you don't have any, just so that you have a record of, of that for your uh, for your notes. Um, summary for today is that we're going to talk about limb loss, uh, amputation, and, and loss of a limb, and uh, walking for the rest of your life with the prosthetic limb. Um, the stereotypical story that you'll see for that is that losing your limb and walking with the prosthesis uh, changes the biomechanics of walking, which it does, and also that it increases the metabolic cost of walking, that it makes walking uh, less efficient, that you spend more energy uh, per, per pound of body mass to walk a unit distance uh, with a prosthesis than with two biological intact legs. And I'm gonna try and convince you, or at least motivate today, that that may not necessarily be the case. Um, limb loss will necessarily lead to some changes in the mechanics of walking, like mechanically the way that you walk, but it doesn't per se on the, in and of itself necessarily need to lead to an increase in the metabolic cost of walking or make walking necessarily uh, become energetically more difficult or less efficient. So if that's a new term for you there per se, it's one that I just recently discovered. It's one of those terms that you, I hear all the time, but I didn't really know what it meant. Um, per se is a shorthand way of saying in and of itself or intrinsically. And so what we're getting at here is you lose a limb and you're walking with a prosthetic limb. And does that, that walking with that prosthesis, does that in and of itself lead directly to an increase in the metabolic cost of walking? Or could this increase that we might see in somebody who now walks with a prosthetic limb if they have a high metabolic cost of walking, could that possibly be from uh, other downstream changes to the body that result from limb loss, such as loss of fitness um, or, or, uh, or less, uh, less physical activity, less ex exercise? And could that be the thing that's increasing the metabolic cost and not necessarily the, the loss of the limb directly itself? That's, that's what we'll explore today. Uh, a caveat here is that everything that I say today um, refers specifically to unilateral transtibial limb loss and a prosthesis that's a unilateral transtibial prosthesis. Um, limb loss of the lower limbs, you could of course lose uh, part of one leg, you could of course lose part of the other leg, you could lose parts of both legs. Um, unilateral here refers to folks who have lost 
uh, part of just one leg. And so their other leg is, is a fully biologically intact leg. Um, transtibial is a fancy way of saying below the knee. So this would be somebody that has uh, lost their limb due to, due to injury or due to some other uh, health issue below the knee, and then has a little bit of their, uh, of their shank remaining here, but does not have an ankle or a foot or most of, most of the, uh, the, the lower leg remaining there. Um, another type of, of limb loss in the lower limb that's common is called a transfemoral limb loss or above knee limb loss, which would be somebody who has the leg lost or amputated um, above the knee. And that, that's typically a much more uh, serious mobility limitating condition than transtibial or below knee limb loss. So everything that I say today, um, if I throughout this lecture ever refer generically to uh, limb loss, um, it's referring specifically to unilateral transtibial limb loss, losing part of one leg um, below the knee only. Now, what you'll typically see if you dive into the literature on the energy cost of walking and the mechanics and energetics of walking um, with limb loss is that you'll see that the metabolic cost, the, the, the calories per mile essentially, or the, the energy that you expend to translate a unit mass by a unit distance is relatively high in folks with limb loss. Um, these are eight studies here that uh, studied the energy cost of walking, the metabolic cost of walking in folks with limb loss. Um, the blue bars here are the uh, walking speeds. Oops, sorry. The blue bars here are the walking speeds of these individuals with limb loss. And the orange bars are the metabolic cost of walking in the folks with limb loss. Um, they are scaled here to give you the ratio of their walking speed in blue um, or their metabolic cost in orange relative to able-bodied controls, to people that didn't have limb loss and to, to, to age-matched or whatever matched individuals uh, that had two biologically intact legs. And so you can see in these studies that across the board, the individuals with limb loss had a relatively high metabolic cost of walking, um, regardless of if they walked at a little bit slower speed, regardless of if they walked at a little bit faster speed, and regardless of if they walked at about the same speed as the controls, they had a higher metabolic cost of walking um, than the, the able-bodied control subjects. So suggesting that what I said on the previous slide is maybe not correct, that metabolic or that limb loss does necessarily have a fairly high metabolic cost of walking. So this is not good, right? This is the, the metabolic cost here. This is the effort of walking sort of. Um, when, you're, when you're running or walking at faster speeds and it feels more difficult, um, what you're sensing there is, is kind of the time rate of energy expenditure, the calories per minute, like how hard it feels right now. You're not really directly sensing uh, the calories to go a certain distance or the calories per mile, um, but it's still an index of effort. And if it's too high, this is generally not good. It makes uh, walking feel difficult. It can limit mobility, like preclude you from traveling certain distances or long distances. And this is generally not something that we want for, uh, for able-bodied folks or for people that, that have to walk with prostheses for whatever reason. So this is not a good thing to have a high metabolic cost of walking, generally speaking. It might be good when exercising, like if you want to burn a lot of calories to, uh, to, for uh, weight loss, or, but it's generally not good for uh, mobility in, 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 the, uh, in the living world. Um, in older adults, a high metabolic cost of walking is particularly a bad thing. Um, it's been shown that uh, individuals that have a rising metabolic cost, like if it's getting a higher uh, over time, like if from your 60s to your 70s to your 80s, your metabolic cost goes up, um, that predicts a decline in gait speed as you age. And as we noted a couple lectures ago, a declining gait speed and a, a slow preferred walking speed and the inability to walk quickly is a strong predictor of, of uh, future disability and all-cause mortality. So a high energy cost of walking may be an even earlier predictor of uh, future general health issues and, and unfortunately mortality in, in, in uh, adults as we age. So we don't want this. We don't want a high metabolic cost of walking, generally speaking. This is a bad thing. We'd like to do something about it. So eight studies here that seem to suggest folks with uh, limb loss have a high metabolic cost of walking. But here I tacked on three additional studies that look like they might tell a different story. Um, here's study number nine, which is only a little bit higher than the controls. And statistically, this one was actually uh, not higher than the controls. On average, it was a little higher, but statistically there was no difference there. Um, and then studies 10 and 11 here, these were ones where the in individuals with limb loss had the same metabolic cost as a uh, control. So they had no different metabolic cost than individuals that had two biologically intact legs. So now this seems like it's not so clear, right? If I looked at just these eight studies on the left, yeah, high metabolic cost of walking with limb loss. 
On the right, though, I get a different story. I say, oh, maybe not. So what's special, if anything, about these three studies over here? Is there something unique about them? Is this maybe they studied a slightly different population of, of limb loss individuals than these other studies? What's, what's going on here? Why are these ones seemingly different? Um, well, these ones on the left, the eight previous studies here, um, these are a little bit older. Um, they were published between 1963 and 1994. Um, but with the important exception here of study number three, which was published uh, in the 2000s sometimes. And so this one's not actually a terribly old study compared to these other ones. Um, so maybe this is possible that these ones on the left, with one exception here, these are old studies. And these three on the right, these are more recent, newer studies. And so maybe over time, we've developed better rehabilitation techniques, uh, better prosthesis technology. Maybe, maybe that's the explaining factor here. That's, that's, that's one possibility. Um, I would argue that's not a likely case uh, because most individuals with limb loss don't have access to great uh, rehabilitative care and physical therapy and those sorts of things. Um, and also the technology for prostheses, at least for affordable prostheses, really hasn't taken any massive quantum leaps in the last 40 years or so. And so I think it's unlikely just based on technology and improvements in uh, care and prosthesis technology that you might see different results on these three uh, more recent studies on the right here. So what else might be different about these studies on the right? Well, these three on the left, or sorry, these, uh, these eight ones on the left here, um, these were general uh, studies of the general population of individuals with limb loss. Now, the vast majority of folks that have a leg amputated um, have it amputated not for uh, traumatic injury to that leg, like if you're in a uh, like if you're in, in the military and, and get an injury in combat, or if you're in a car accident and, and injure your leg or something like that. Um, that happens, of course, but the vast majority of people in the general uh, population who have amputation surgeries get them due to what's called uh, dysvascular issues, which are uh, not always, but are typically complications uh, resulting from long-term diabetes that lead to uh, disruptions to the neural control and the, and the uh, sensation and the physiology of the muscles in the leg. Um, you can lose feeling in the bottom of the foot due to uh, loss of, of some of the nerve endings down there, which can uh, result in uh, painful ulcers on the foot and, and, and skin diseases and things like that. Uh, the muscles can waste away, the bones can waste away. It's, it's a pretty, pretty tough situation for these folks with uh, severe dysvascular issues of the lower limb and of the foot, and often can re uh, require an, an amputation surgery, unfortunately, to, to save the patient's life a lot of the time. And so uh, the majority of folks, the, the vast majority of the folks in the general population who undergo uh, limb loss surgery are not undergoing it for traumatic injury, but are undergoing it for dysvascular issues. Now, those folks um, are typically diabetics, they're typically overweight or obese, and they're typically older adults, um, not the strongest muscles and bones in the world and not the strongest cardiovascular systems in the world, um, along with their limb loss and their diabetes just generally aren't in great uh, physical health a lot of the time. And so there's some complicating factors here um, beyond the fact that they've lost a limb and are walking with the prosthesis that could feasibly increase the energy cost of walking here. Now, what about these three studies on the right? Well, study eight, which is a little bit different here, and study number nine, which is a more recent one, um, these were in children, um, mostly in kids who are kids, so they're fairly young, and who were, because their children haven't had a long time to gain a lot of e extra body weight, or typically not obese, um, they're mostly in children who had um, congenital issues, like you're, you're born with uh, legs that did not develop normally and typically for whatever reason, or uh, children who had uh, bone cancer, unfortunately, at an early age in life and underwent amputations because of that. And so these children, while it's not, of course, we don't want children to develop atypically, and we don't want children to have bone cancer, of course, um, but other than those issues where they've lost a limb early on in life and now walk with the prosthetic limb, um, they're fairly young and are otherwise in typically fairly good, at least musculoskeletal health a lot of the time. And so here, at least in this one study on children who compared to this general population were fairly young, uh, fairly healthy body weight, and fairly overall in good health other than their limb loss did not have a particularly high metabolic cost of walking compared to uh, typically developing children or children without limb loss. But we do see this exception over here, study eight, where children with limb loss did indeed have a fairly high metabolic cost of walking. So this comparison here isn't, isn't super compelling. 
Um, but what about these other two over here? These are the two that I'll spend most of the time uh, talking about today in terms of motivating this notion that limb loss does not necessarily increase metabolic cost of walking. Um, these were done, these studies uh, 10 and 11, where we saw no difference in metabolic cost of walking uh, in limb loss uh, individuals versus controls. Uh, these were done in military service members. Uh, study number 10 was uh, members of the United States military, and study number 11 was uh, members of the United Kingdom's military. Now, these folks, like the children in study nine, um, these folks are demographically quite a bit different from the general largely dysvascular population of limb loss over here on the left. Um, studies on the left, these are typically older adults, individuals in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, the military service members here, they're fairly young. The individuals in these studies, were, most of them were in their 20s and 30s. You're, you're active duty service members who get injuries that require amputations and prostheses, they're typically fairly young. Um, they're also, other than their amputations, of course, are compared to the general population in fairly good physical health, at least before the amputation surgery, they had a, due to their requirements of military service, um, had pretty high level of physical fitness, fairly strong, uh, fairly fit muscles, fairly fit cardiovascular system. So just generally good athletic physical health um, for these folks. And then the other thing about the military population here is that they typically have access to a much higher quality of uh, rehabilitative care and just overall health care than the general population has access to here. So suggesting that maybe an increase in metabolic cost is not necessarily an inevitable consequence of losing your limb um, if you are fairly fit and fairly strong and otherwise physically healthy, maybe you don't necessarily have to walk with a high metabolic cost of walking. Now, again, just to drive home what's especially, especially different about these uh, military service members that have uh, limb loss compared to your typical population with limb loss, um, these are the individuals here in uh, study number 10 up here. And you can see here that they are fairly young. On average, the uh, people with limb loss in this study were under 30 years old, where if you look at the average age in any of these other studies, it was probably in their 50s and 60s, if not older. Um, they're also fairly recently uh, independently ambulatory, only been walking independently with their prosthesis uh, for about six months uh, when, when they were tested for their metabolic cost here, um, meaning they were fairly recently out of rehabilitative care and, and physical therapy and just getting back up on their feet, uh, generally speaking, and so it didn't yet have accrued a lot of time to uh, lose their mobility and lose their strength and, and lose their fitness. So at the time when these folks were tested, they were quite young and quite strong and quite physically fit compared to your general population with limb loss. And similar story here for the, the study on the individuals in the United Kingdom military here, study 11, uh, you can see that they were fairly young and fairly recently since they had their, their injuries, um, possibly explaining why they were able, uh, due to their fitness, to walk uh, with a relatively low metabolic cost of walking compared to the general limb loss population here. So this is something that I, as, as a biomechanics researcher, got clued into uh, only within like the last 10 years or so. And I thought this was really cool because it challenges our typical paradigm on what necessarily happens after a limb loss. Um, it definitely changes the way that you walk a little bit, but does it necessarily have to make walking more difficult, at least energetically more difficult? These studies on the military population say maybe it doesn't. Maybe after limb loss, if you're able to achieve or at least maintain a high level of fitness and a high level of physical activity and otherwise overall good uh, musculoskeletal and cardiovascular health, maybe you can then also maintain a quote unquote normal metabolic cost of walking. Maybe walking doesn't have to at least energetically feel more difficult. So these studies suggest that that's the case. But an issue here is that these are all cross-sectional studies, right? They're comparing this group of people to this different group of people. And the underlying assumption is that these folks with limb loss, before they had limb loss, were like these control subjects over here. Um, that's an assumption. And is it a good assumption? Well, we don't really know, right? We can't really do like a long-term longitudinal study on limb loss. It's very difficult to just collect a bunch of data on people and then follow them over time and see, well, who loses their limb, who doesn't, right? Um, we also can't experimentally induce limb loss, right? That wouldn't be an, an ethical thing or a feasible thing to do. And so we're left here to kind of guess, you know, what's actually happening longitudinally with these folks who lose their limbs. Does their metabolic cost uh, compared to what it was before limb loss, does it go up? Does it go down? Does it stay the same? We're kind of just guessing and comparing them to 
uh, demographically similar populations without observing in practice how or if it actually changes after their, their own individual limb loss. We'd like to be able to do that, but for practicality and, and ethicality reasons, we can't really. So hypothetically, it would be great if we could isolate this effect, right? This is what we try to do in science and biomechanics and in basically any realm of science. We try to isolate effects as best we can. I want to measure a change in some variable and I wanna be able to explain why it changed in, in some particular direction with some particular magnitude. The best way to do that is to isolate that effect, to change just one thing that then results in this change. So hypothetically, what if I was able to isolate the effect of limb loss? What if hypothetically somebody lost a limb and then started walking with the prosthesis, but had no secondary changes whatsoever after that? Uh, the strength of their muscles didn't change, the composition of their body didn't change, nothing physically changed about their body at all, except for the loss of the limb and replacing it with a prosthetic limb like you see in the cartoon down here. Um, that's of course not a very realistic situation, right? Somebody that uh, has an injury that's severe enough to require amputation and, and limb loss and walking with the prosthesis, um, they're gonna have some really long-term serious downtime, right? Recovering or preparing for that surgery, recovering from that surgery, learning to walk with the prosthetic limb. That's gonna be probably many months, maybe a handful of years of a deviation from your usual level of, of physical activity, probably gonna to lead to some changes in the body, right? So maybe this isn't really a very realistic situation to speculate on, but it's a scientifically interesting one, right? What if we could isolate the effect, the sole effect of limb loss with no other changes to the body whatsoever? What if somebody was able to fully maintain their strength and fitness pre-limb loss after limb loss? Would they then be able to maintain a normal metabolic cost of walking? Or is a change in that cost necessarily inevitable, even in this idealized hypothetical situation? Um, we can't study that in human subjects, but it's a great application or a great example of something that we can study with computer models, like we saw in the study last time, simulating uh, vertical jumping with and without practice and uh, with and without changes in strength. Great example of using computer models. This is another example of something that's uh, best studied and I, I would say can only be studied uh, with computer models. A uh, student asked, how do they measure metabolic costs for subjects? Um, this is done, if you've taken Kines 360, the exercise physiology class, I think they demonstrate this for you. Um, if you haven't uh, taken Kines 360 yet, uh, the way that metabolic cost is typically measured is you'll hop on a treadmill um, or they also make like backpack wearable machines like this that you can do like walking outdoors or on a track or whatever. Um, but you'll typically do it on a treadmill and you wear a, a mask that connects with a tube to some hardware on a computer. And the, the mask and the hardware and the computer is measuring the oxygen that you consume and the carbon dioxide that you produce. Okay? And if you know those two things, the volume of oxygen consumed and the volume of carbon dioxide produced through respiration, um, combusting those gases uh, has known like uh, masses of the three macronutrients in the body, uh, carbohydrates and uh, protein and fat uh, that's required in, in those chemical reactions. And then each of those macronutrients has a certain uh, calorie amount attached to them. So a little bit of math and a little bit of assumptions there, you can uh, use that, that pulmonary gas exchange data to uh, compute the rate at which somebody's consuming metabolic energy when they, when they do a movement like walking is typically how it's done. So beyond the fact that we'd scientifically like to isolate this effect, um, why is this an interesting question or approach to use? Why is dinner generating computer simulations here of walking with and without a prosthesis and the energy cost of that? Why is, why is this an interesting thing to do? Um, historically, the field of P&O, which stands for prosthetics and orthotics, um, has been highly predicated on the skill and experience and intuition of the clinicians working with these patients. It's a very uh, kind of artful uh, clinical practice. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's just historically what the field has, has been like for, for most of its existence over the past 50 or 60 years or so. Um, in, in more modern times, the field of prosthetics and orthotics has started to um, integrate more centrally uh, science and data in terms of decision-making uh, for 
um, uh, for patients that are being seen by these clinicians. So not just using the clinician's skill and experience and intuition to select the prosthesis for an individual and, and adjust it to be the best for them. Um, that's always going to be an important thing in prosthetics and orthotics. Um, but using science and using data to help inform those decisions has started to, to be a more common thing in the field and I think will continue to be a more common thing in the field. Um, it's also interesting and relevant towards the clinical goals of the patients. Um, they often, if you talk to uh, individuals with limb loss in terms of what they want, um, they want it to be, you know, if you ask them like, what do you, what do you want to get out of this, this prosthesis or out of your, your rehabilitation? Um, they want to typically just get back to living, get back to a, a normal, functional, mobile life. They don't want walking to be difficult. They don't want it to be a pain in the neck to get up and play with their kids or walk to the store or get in out of the car, right? They want to be able to be functional and mobile in daily life. And so there's a lot to that beyond just the energy cost of walking, but walking is kind of the characteristic human movement, right? It's how we move about the world in the absence of cars and things like that. And so getting back to, or even better than your pre-limb loss level of performance in things like walking uh, is, is often a common clinical goal for patients like this. Um, I think it can also be a, a motivational thing, right? If you lose your limb and you look in most of the scientific literature, it's basically paints a pretty pretty bleak picture for you, right? Things are going to be hard. Walking is going to be difficult for the rest of your life. It's going to consume more energy for the rest of your life. It's going to wear you out. You're not going to be able to travel long distances. Well, is that necessarily the case? Maybe it's not from losing the limb. Maybe it's what you can't prevent, right? It's already happened. We can't get it back. We can't grow limbs in a lab and reattach them to somebody, but we can try to improve our fitness. We can try to maintain our fitness, right? These are not impossible things. They're more difficult with only one biological limb or with no biological limbs, but they're not out of the realm of possibility. They're attainable for, for most people. And so if we can show here scientifically that, well, if losing the limb doesn't necessarily lead to inevitably an increase in energy cost of walking, I think that can be an important thing for emphasizing to the user of the prosthesis, here's what you can expect if you're able to engage heavily and, and seriously in, in, a, in a fitness program, in an exercise program. So this is a topic that I got interested in uh, with my colleague, Elizabeth uh, Russell Esposito, who's a, a scientist at the Seattle uh, Veterans Administration now that studies uh, limb loss in, in service members and military service members. Um, she was the, the first author on uh, study number 10 a few slides ago and uh, showed the first uh, data on this military population, these relatively young, relatively fit and strong uh, service members with limb loss who had a normal metabolic cost of walking. Um, we then used a computer model that you see on the right here to simulate walking with and without uh, limb loss. And so we did a virtual longitudinal study. Um, we took some computer models here of the body, like you saw in the you know, models similar to the model from the jumping study we talked about last time, and simulated walking gates with them, um, both before limb loss and both after limb loss. Um, before doing that, we wanted to gain some confidence in the model's ability to uh, predict changes in the energy cost of walking. And so we did some comparisons here on the left of the energy cost of the model, both uh, without limb loss in the black dots and uh, with limb loss in the orange dots uh, to see how its energy cost of walking changed over a range of walking speeds and just see if it made uh, reasonable comparisons in terms of the sensitivity of energy cost of walking in the model to walking speed compared to energy cost of walking in actual uh, human subjects when, when they walked at different speeds. And in most cases got a pretty good comparison uh, between the model's predictions of uh, the energy speed relationship versus measurements of those actual data from, from live human subjects. So just gaining some confidence that the model here can, can feasibly predict small changes in energy cost of walking that could be important. Okay, if it's not obvious what you're looking at here from the labels, um, these are stick figure traces of a representative uh, subject here that we simulate. And these are like computer subjects. These are just different instances of the computer model that, that generated these simulations of walking uh, with and without a below knee prosthesis. Um, the dark lines, the, the black and the uh, gray lines are the left and right legs and then the trunk up here of the model walking before it had limb loss. And then the colored lines here, the orange and the blue lines are the uh, same subject, the same virtual subject, um, walking after limb loss. And you can see here their metabolic cost essentially did not change 
um, when they lost their limb. Now, importantly, in this virtual subject here, this computer modeled subject, nothing else changed about them. Their muscle strength stayed the same other than the lost muscles, of course. Their body mass stayed the same. Their body composition stayed the same. The, all, all, all the properties of their body and their muscles stayed exactly the same. Um, they merely just lost their, their limb uh, below the knee and then were walking with the prosthesis um, after that. And from that saw, the, the key one to look here is the, uh, the first uh, uh, plot here on the, on the left. Um, if we generated these simulations over 25 virtual subjects here, um, on average saw actually no change in metabolic cost of walking um, after limb loss, as long as they didn't lose any muscular strength of, of, the, uh, of the body accompanying that limb loss. Um, if they lost even 10% of that muscular strength, then their metabolic cost went up by not quite 10%, but roughly 10%. And importantly, even if you then took the parameters of the prosthesis, the stiffness and damping of it and mass and all the typical things you might optimize in a clinical setting with the prosthesis and tuned them as best as possible for reducing metabolic cost of that person, um, if you'd already lost even just 10% of your muscle strength, uh, you were not able to mitigate that increase in metabolic cost, even with a specially tuned prosthesis just for you, uh, couldn't offset that 10% that increase in, or 10% loss of strength. Um, if you lost 30% uh, of your strength, which is not an unusual strength loss after limb loss in the general population, then even with a really expensive, really fancy high-tech battery-powered prosthesis that kind of replaces the overall kinetic effect of the muscles um, even then you weren't able to, to reduce your energy cost of walking back to baseline levels. So the only way here in these simulations to maintain a normal pre-limb loss metabolic cost of walking post-limb loss was to maintain your muscle strength. Then even if you were walking with an unoptimized generic prosthesis, then you were able to maintain a, a normal metabolic cost of walking after limb loss, at least in these simulations. Now, an important caveat here is that this model was two-dimensional. It was confined only to the sagittal plane. Um, many of the gait deviations in terms of changes in somebody's walking mechanics that you see after limb loss um, occur outside of the sagittal plane. They occur in the frontal plane and in the transverse plane. And so, and, and that uh, especially the need to kind of balance the body and control the balance of the body in the frontal plane when you're walking, um, that has a modest metabolic cost to it. There's been studies partitioning out the energy cost of walking in terms of what fraction is used to support the body weight against gravity, what fraction is used to like break your, your speed in the, in the forward direction and speed you up in the forward direction, what fraction is used to like balance you laterally. Um, supporting you against gravity is typically the overwhelming largest chunk of the whole energy cost of walking or running, um, but balancing yourself in the lateral plane is, 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 a, is a modest non-negligible fraction of that cost. And we weren't modeling that here in our two-dimensional model. You'd need a three-dimensional model to do that. So more recently here, we followed up this 2D finding, um, basically repeating it with a more realistic three-dimensional model like you see here. And so this on the left was the, the pre-limb loss model, of course. This is a model that, uh, one, not, not to toot my own horn here, but one, one of the more realistic and, and complicated models that's used for this, this type of work in biomechanics. And this is, of course, the pre-limb loss model. You can see it has uh, two fully intact biological limbs there. And then we did on the model a virtual uh, amputation, limb loss surgery here. You can see it's lost uh, on its uh, right leg. It's lost um, all of the bones and muscles uh, below the knee here, about midway through the knee. And then we replace that with a, a passive uh, transtibial prosthetic limb here. And you can see here that prosthetic limb uh, moving around. And the prosthetic foot there flexing and extending. Okay, we then generate some simulations uh, with those models, the pre-limb loss model and the post-limb loss model to try to isolate the effect of uh, adding that prosthetic limb or the effect of limb loss and adding the prosthesis on the energy cost of walking. Um, how is that done exactly? It involves a technique that's called optimal control simulations. And if you've taken some engineering classes, this may be something you've heard of before. I'm guessing most of you haven't heard of this before, so let's spend a little bit of time on that. Um, an optimal control simulation or the optimal control method is broadly speaking, um, the way of finding the best way to control a mechanical system um, out of many possible feasible ways of controlling that system. Um, an example that I think I gave earlier in class is that if I ask everybody watching the video right now to touch your nose, you'll probably do something like this, right? 
um, whether you paid conscious attention to it or not, you moved your hand and your finger and your, your limbs of your joints to, to move your finger to your nose through a particular trajectory, right? I flexed my shoulder in a certain way, I flexed my elbow in a certain way, wrist and fingers all, all moved them in a certain way to move my index finger along that path to my nose. Okay? Um, that wasn't the only way I had of meeting this goal of touching my nose. Okay? I don't have to do it like this. I could have done it like this. I could have done it like this. I could have done it lots of different possible trajectories I could have moved my hand through to meet the goal there of touching my nose. So why did I do this particular way subconsciously? Well, presumably there's some benefit to achieving that task that way. Um, maybe it's for whatever reason, the easiest or the most comfortable way of doing that. Maybe it consumes the least metabolic energy, right? So optimal control here is a way of finding what's the best way to do a movement like this or a movement like this um, with some goal task oriented framework here, okay? Minimizing or maximizing some index of performance given some constraints or given some restrictions on what you can do or might want to do. Um, this method was born in the 19... 50s or so when space travel became a big thing and also when the cold war was a big thing and we in the soviet union were trying to figure out how we were going to shoot missiles at each other if it ever came to that which it didn't fortunately um but for the for a more peaceful example picture you have a spaceship blasting off here and it's going to fly to the moon and you might guess that the mass of the spaceship here is critical right the more massive it is more expensive it is to build uh, more fuel it's got to carry maybe the more things on it that could possibly fail and cause a problem and so filling the spaceship here with the least amount of fuel or the smallest mass of fuel here is generally a good thing to do. There's really no benefit other than, you know, emergency situations that you'd hopefully avoid of carrying like a lot of extra unused fuel on a spaceship like this. And so uh, uh, the, the original applications of optimal control were figuring out, okay, how do I get a spaceship from Earth into space and to the moon and back? with minimum fuel consumption, okay? What are the bursts of like rocket activity that each one consuming a certain amount of fuel, what are the ones that I need that will achieve that goal of getting from earth to the moon and around and back with the minimum amount of, of consumption of fuel? Okay? Um, the more biomechanical example there would be if I want to walk from place to place, if I wanna get up from my desk and walk to my car when I, when I finish the lecture here, um, what's the way to do that that consumes the least amount of metabolic energy? What's the way to use my muscles that uh, requires the least calories to expend and consume to travel from my desk to my car? That'd be an example of, of the optimal control perspective on uh, human movement or on controlling a system, in this case, the human body. So that performance that you're trying to maximize, the, the way to make the performance the best, um, typically you'll define some cost. You'll define a mathematical function that represents the cost of what you're doing. Okay? Um, for example, for space flight here, we might consider our cost or our quantity that we wanna minimize to have a good solution here to be the time taken. We'd like to get to the moon in a, a practical amount of time, not, not years, but you know, maybe days would be a good thing, um, plus the amount of fuel consumed. Okay? And then the W here would just be some, some weighting factor. I could set W to a million, and that would mean I don't care about how long it takes. I just wanna consume very little fuel. Um, I could set W to zero, and then that says, I don't care how much fuel I have to use. I just want to minimize the time it takes to get to the moon. Um, in reality, I'd set W here to, to some moderate value. So this is a weighted sum that it's considering both of these things in terms of determining how to control this thing. I want it to not take too much time, and I want it to not consume too much fuel. Now, what about for individuals with limb loss? How might we simulate limb loss gait? Well, we should consider clinical goals or goals after rehabilitation of people with limb loss. What do they want? Um, if you talk to patients with limb loss and folks that now have to walk with a prosthesis for the rest of your life, um, they want a variety of things, a variety of different goals, as you might imagine, for different people from different walks of life, having different perspectives and different things that they might want to accomplish. But most of them want one or both of these two things. Um, they don't want to have a lot of gait deviations, meaning they want their gait to kind of mechanically look and, and feel as normal as possible. And they don't want to spend too much effort doing it. They want to minimize their metabolic cost or from some more higher level idea, just the overall muscular effort that it requires to walk. Okay? And so this is how we generated these simulations here with the model. We gave the model a task of walking, of performing a, a periodic stride of walking. 
um, with minimum gate deviations, meaning track normal human walking biomechanic state as close as you can, um, but don't, don't track it so well that it requires an excessive amount of muscular effort. So minimize your gate deviations plus your level of muscular effort with some weighting so that you consider both of these things, that both of these things matter. Now, how this is done in a traditional uh, forward dynamics approach, you guys have done a forward dynamics experiment in the lab previously. Um, this is a bunch of math and equations and stuff. The easier way to describe this verbally is suppose I take my cell phone here and suppose I fling it across the room. Okay? And suppose after I've flung it and it's flying through the air, I snap my fingers and I freeze it. And I ask you, okay, I'm gonna snap my fingers and unfreeze it. Um, I want you to predict where it's gonna be a short time in the future when I unfreeze it. Now to do that accurately, what information would you need? If your cell phone is flying across the room, and it freezes here, and you say, okay, it's gonna unfreeze. What information do you need to know about it right now to predict where it's gonna move or where it's gonna be a short time after I unfreeze it? Well, you'd of course need to know where it is right now, right, to predict where it's gonna be in the future. And you'd probably have to know its velocity, right? You'd have to know, okay, what direction is it moving when it's frozen right here? Um, you might also wanna know the forces acting on it, right? If it's in outer space and there's no gravity acting on it versus if it's on earth and there's gravity acting on it, you might expect it goes through a different trajectory depending on the forces acting on it. Okay? Um, that's essentially how these simulations occur. Okay? You have these models here with these muscles. Um, you have some hypothetical nervous system that sends control signals to those muscles. Those muscles develop forces. Those forces produce moments at the joints. Those moments press the feet into the ground here with these little balls on them that generate ground reaction forces. And if you do that in the right way, you give it the right muscle excitations at the right time, then you can get the model to kind of stumble forward as if it's walking. Um, if you tell it to try and track target human experimental walking data, you can get it to walk realistically like a human like this. And if you tell it to try and do that while also not exciting the muscles too highly, then you can get it to walk like this with also reasonably low realistic level of, of muscular effort or metabolic cost. Okay? So that's essentially how these simulations are generated. Um, optimize the input excitation controls to the muscles to get the model to move in a certain way, such as normal healthy walking with also minimum muscular effort. Um, another example I could give you for that is if I tell you like, here's a certain trajectory I want you to move your finger through. Okay, Try to move it through there as accurately and as quickly as you possibly can across whatever particular trajectory this is. Um, you could spend a great deal of muscular effort moving it exactly along that trajectory exactly and, and as fast as you possibly could, okay? But that would take a lot of muscular effort. If you slowed down a little bit, so maybe only moved it 95% as fast as you could and maybe deviated from that target trajectory a little bit. Yeah, it's not quite as fast as it could be. It's not quite as accurate as it could be, but it's a lot easier. It's a lot less muscular effort. And maybe that's a good trade-off, okay? So that's essentially what's being simulated here. The trade-off between trying to move like normal walking as best as you can, but not prioritizing that so much that we spend a massive amount of unrealistically high levels of, of energy trying to do that. Okay, for a variety of nerdy reasons, technical reasons, that approach with these types of models is really slow. Um, that's the approach that I used for my, my doctoral dissertation, which wasn't all that long ago. This was in 2006 to 2010, which I like to think wasn't that long ago. And it would be like three days at least, or sometimes nine days of sitting around waiting for the computer to, to spit out simulations like this. Um, we've more recently been using a uh, advanced approach here called direct co-location, which I won't go into the nerdy details of. This is this is all the details here of how it actually works. Um, but what that one is saying is it avoids that process of integrating the motion of the body or of the cell phone forward in time. It avoids the process of freezing it and then predicting where it's going to be forward in time a little bit into the future. Um, for a variety of complex technical reasons, uh, numerically, that calculation is really slow and really difficult. And this is a new approach that solves that same problem, but uh, avoids that complication, has some disadvantages, but ends up working a lot better for these types of biomechanics applications most of the time. Um, if you're interested in getting into this avenue of uh, computer simulations of human movement, um, this is a link you can take a look at. 
Um, OpenSim is the most popular uh, software that people in biomechanics use for generating these types of simulations. And uh, MOCO, it stands for Motion Control Software, is uh, some recently developed extensions to the OpenSim software that allow you to do these direct co-location optimal control uh, simulations. And it's all completely free and, and open source and all very user friendly. So if you're interested in doing a little bit uh, deeper dive into biomechanics, uh, take a look at this. And if this is something anybody's interested in doing like an independent study in, come talk to me sometime. I'm happy to, 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 to get you going on that. It's a really kind of interesting and exciting uh, direction for biomechanics right now. Okay, so we did these pre and post loss simulations uh, using a fairly complex three dimensional model here um, to change the model from a pre limb loss to intact limbs model to a post limb loss one intact limb model. Um, we took away the right leg below the knee and of course took away the foot and all the muscles spanning the ankle there um, replaced the ankle joint here with a uh, basically a torsional spring that represents the typical mechanics of kind of a generic uh, below knee prosthesis. Um, then in both of those versions of the model, the pre-limb loss one on the left and the post-limb loss one on the right, uh, generated simulations of walking. So a periodic stride of walking um, at the same speed and the same stride frequency, just to control for those things, um, minimizing deviations from normal walking mechanics um, plus the amount of muscular effort or muscular energy required to, to walk in that way. Um, this important factor here in this cost function, this weighting term, um, this again, if you set it to zero, then the model won't care about muscular effort. It'll just try and track human data here, minimizing gait deviations come hell or high water, no matter how much energy it costs. Um, on the other hand, if I make W here really, really big, then it'll just try to minimize muscular effort and won't care about how much its gait deviates from, from normal human walking mechanics. So we fiddled with the value of W here to find kind of a modest value that gave reasonably good gait deviations. And you'll, you'll see on the next uh, couple slides that the model looks like a reasonably normal human walking, um, but also uh, had a normal kind of similar to human experimental data energy cost of walking. So kind of striking the balance between these two extremes here, tracking the gait data well, but not tracking it so well that it took an unrealistic amount of, of energy expenditure to do that. Um, so if you're not clear on this gate deviations business, um, in both cases with and without limb loss, we fed the model some uh, target kinematic and kinetic data uh, from experiments on uh, able-bodied human subjects. So you would feed it like a target uh, trajectory for the pelvis to move through, a target angle for the knee to move through a target uh, ground reaction force under the foot that it was trying to, to, to generate as closely as possible in its own walking gait um, with the ability to deviate that from that slightly um, if it consumed a low amount of, of metabolic energy from that, that weighted cost function back there. Um, but that's essentially what the model was trying to do. Feed it kind of a target average gait and try to match that gait, that kind of normal gait for walking as close as you can uh, with also a reasonably low muscular effort. So we generated these simulations in 36 uh, quote unquote subjects. And by, by quote unquote their subjects, I mean, this was again, a computer simulation study. We generated uh, 36 different versions of the model uh, representing hypothetical individuals with different uh, sizes and shapes and muscular properties and things like that. Um, with this computer simulation approach, we're again able to uh, isolate the effect of limb loss. We can keep everything about the model the same in the post limb loss case, no changes in body mass or body composition or strength or power characteristics of the muscles, um, other than the fact that it's lost its limb and, and now has a prosthesis. So again, it's kind of an idealized hypothetical situation of what if you could perfectly maintain the strength and fitness and function of your body after limb loss? Would you still have a normal metabolic cost of walking or would it inevitably go up even if you maintain these things? Okay, a couple limitations here. Um, we had a rigid stump for the prosthesis. That's not realistic. We investigated that in the model, it didn't matter, so we left it here for simplicity, but in absolute sense, it's not realistic. Um, we're not able to directly minimize the metabolic cost in the cost function, so we had to minimize a surrogate of it. Um, the limb loss model was not tracking limb loss data. That's okay. We wanted it to try to uh, match uh, able-bodied data as well as it can. That's typically what uh, patients want. And again, just a reminder that everything today and everything going forward refers to the unilateral uh, transtibial cases only. This wouldn't necessarily extend to bilateral limb loss or to, to above knee limb loss. 
Okay, always good to investigate your model's validity. You should never use a model for something like this uh, without first evaluating whether the model can make realistic predictions of the outcome variable you're looking at, in this case, metabolic cost. Um, so we first generated some simulations of the model walking without limb loss that you can see on the left here. And I found some data in the literature in these gray boxes that examined how people's metabolic cost changed when you add mass to their feet. Okay, and you can see that it went up roughly linearly here with more mass added to the feet. Um, so then we simulated those conditions in the model. We used this model with this cost function and optimal control framework from the previous few slides, uh, running those simulations with extra mass added to the feet here, um, shown in these black dots that got pretty, pretty good comparison here to the human experimental data. Um, also did those simulations with and without an ankle brace, with an ankle brace added to the model to kind of limit its, its range of motion and increase its stiffness there. And also there got a fairly good comparison uh, to what's typically seen in terms of change in metabolic cost uh, in, in humans that walk with or without an ankle brace like that. So not necessarily showing the effect of prosthesis here, right? Prosthesis has different mass than a biological leg and different stiffness than a biological leg, um, but giving some confidence that a model like this uh, can predict small changes in metabolic cost uh, for things that are kind of analogous to a prosthesis. Okay, what did this actually look like? Um, on the left is the model walking in, obviously in, in the pre-limb loss case. And on the right is the model walking, obviously in the post-limb loss case. And if you look really closely, and if I were to show you graphs of these things, you could see that there were some small deviations in the uh, biomechanics of the models walking after a limb loss here. It's, it's kinematics aren't quite the same. It's kinetics aren't quite the same, but they're pretty darn close. Okay? Um, I would argue that if I took the model here and I put pants on it and I put shoes on it and you couldn't tell which limb is the prosthetic limb, you would be fairly hard pressed to look at these and, and guess accurately overall as a group, which one is the one with the prosthesis? Is it the one on the right? Is it the one on the left? And this is generally my experience with what you see in this young, fit, relatively healthy military population with limb loss, is that if it's, if it's below knee like this, and if it's unilateral, um, unless they're in the lab and they've got shorts on and you can visibly see like, okay, there's the prosthetic limb. And a lot of them, it's really hard to tell um, which one is, is the, uh, the prosthetic limb. It's not obvious that their gait is deviating substantially uh, mechanically from, from normal able-bodied gait here. And so this was a case, again, where these were basically the same individual simulated here um, before their limb loss on the left, after their limb loss on the right, and no major changes in their gait mechanics, here, at least no obvious visual changes. And just some data backing that up. You can see the pre-limb loss case on the left in blue and the post-limb loss case in red. Some subtle deviations in their ground reaction forces, nothing too substantial. What about their energy cost of walking? Um, here on the left is everybody's pre-limb loss metabolic cost, calories per mile. And here on the right is everybody's post-limb loss metabolic cost. Okay. So the dot or the lines connecting these dots, if it's a solid line, that subject's metabolic cost went up with limb loss. If it's a dashed line, that subject's metabolic cost went down after limb loss. So you see kind of a wide range here. Some people went up quite a bit. Some people went down quite a bit. Uh, some people went up or down a little bit. Some didn't change much at all. But if you look at the red dots, which are the averages of these two things, you can see on average, no significant change in metabolic cost post limb loss here. Um, this is just another graph showing those basically same data. Um, these are called equivalence plots. Oh, sorry. Um, these bars on the vertical part here, this bar here at a 0.07 or so, um, that's kind of the minimum detectable change in metabolic cost that you could probably hope to measure with any consistency or accuracy in uh, human subjects. And so as long as the error bars on this mean change in metabolic cost here, as long as they don't touch this uh, kind of minimum detectable change of interest here, then that gives you some confidence that this change is both not significant from zero and is also significantly below the, the minimum detectable effect that you could probably feasibly measure in human subjects. So just giving us some statistical support that uh, limb loss here in, in these simulated experiments uh, did not increase the metabolic cost of walking. So we see a similar result here to the 2D, uh, earlier 2D study. When I simulate walking in three dimensions here uh, with limb loss in isolation, we do not see an increase in metabolic cost. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that 
trans or the things outside of the sagittal plane are not important in limb loss. They're very important, but it possibly suggests that the the uh, the sagittal plane, what's happening in the sagittal plane in terms of balancing your body weight and uh, uh, maintaining or, or modulating your walking speed, is the majority of, of of where energy cost of walking comes from. Here. So limb loss does not, at least in computer models, and at least not in uh, relatively healthy, relatively young military service members, uh, does not appear to increase the metabolic cost of walking. So what does in all these other studies that, that show a different result? Um, I think it's, again, the secondary changes that occur to somebody's body after limb loss. Um, typically, after somebody loses their limb, um, they have a significant period of downtime in terms of recovering from that surgery and learning to walk again. And also after losing their limb, most people just don't exercise as much as they used to, if they were exercising at all previously. Um, strength and fitness losses have been shown to lead to about a 20% increase in metabolic cost of walking. Um, you can also find studies that say strength and fitness uh, gains can reduce energy cost of walking by about 20% in this population. So I think this is a major factor um, other than limb loss itself that we need to start promoting and motivating uh, in this population. Um, a poorly adjusted prosthesis can also be a factor here. Um, that, at least in studies that I'm aware of, only affects metabolic costs by about 3%, but still that's, that's a meaningful amount, right? We get really excited about running shoes these days that change metabolic costs by two to 4%. So adjusting your prosthesis so that it improves it by 3%, that, that can be a big deal too. Um, in terms of clinical meaningfulness of these data, it's important to remember these are computer simulated subjects. These are not actual humans. So keep that in mind in terms of gauging, you know, what should we infer from this for clinical care and practice for actual human patients. Um, the models and data here, these are never going to replace the, the work like you know, kind of in the field that clinicians do and actually working with this population. We, we shouldn't try to replace that. We're not going to replace that. That wouldn't be a good thing. Um, but however, they think they can give suggestions for what might be wrong in, in particular strange clinical cases or what might work in terms of uh, possible novel solutions to those cases. Um, we can also, in these types of uh, simulations, possibly generate a model that is tuned to represent a, a specific patient, a specific individual, and do some hypothetical kind of what-if simulations for them. Like, okay, what if, what if I adjust this person's prosthesis in this or that way? Or what if I put them on this training program versus that training program? Uh, what's hypothetically going to be best for them for gait deviations? What's going to be best for them for balance? What's going to be best for them for energy cost of walking or whatever their particular goals might be? And to avoid giving you the impression that this is a, a new idea, this idea of generating these kind of personalized patient specific simulations to figure out like what clinically is best for them. Um, people in biomechanics have been talking about this since 1971, which was about nine years before I was born. And so this has been going on for a long time. Um, even back then in the early seventies, uh, scientists in biomechanics were uh, hypothesizing that we were gonna be able to generate simulations like this that could not just be used in, in science and in publishing scientific papers and teaching classes and stuff like this, but actually used on the ground in clinical practice as a standard part of, of clinical care. Um, we're starting to get there in some avenues of clinical care, in particular uh, children with cerebral palsy. It's fairly common that they'll undergo clinical gait analysis and some musculoskeletal modeling to uh, inform a, a surgery that the surgeon might do for that patient. Um, but in other realms of, of clinical care and certainly in, in prosthesis adjustments and fittings and limb loss surgeries, we're not quite there yet, but maybe in another 30 years or 60 years or however long it takes, maybe we'll get there eventually and see kind of a more cohesive blend here between the clinical world of biomechanics and the academic world of biomechanics. And that is it for today. Thank you. You're welcome.